It's been set up to where it will automatically uh, load now. We shall see. Okay, we got that working right. Okay. Well, we'll give it a few more minutes before we start. If you have any questions or anything we need to discuss. The only part that I wanted to, um, this is Brandy again, I wanted to uh, just tack on is um, the groups. I know that there was um, some folks who already posted and they've got their groups together and just want to confirm that if you know those of us that are left over we really don't have a preference to be you know which group we're in i mean i have such a diverse background you know from property taxes and ad valorem taxes to oil and gas to commercial real estate i really don't care what group i'm in as long as it's you know something that that you know, would benefit the group i'm really i'm sure. pretty flexible so, is what so i'm here's trying to what say mitchell and i were going to do and i do apologize for this <laughs> My little can, we can, me. Uh, can we uh, put everybody on mute again? Because we have a lot of background noise. It's going to be hard to hear. Okay. Where's the background noise coming from? Uh, somebody's microphone. I don't know which one. It looks like Letty, maybe? There she goes. She got it. Okay. We awesome. have 26 participants on now. So I can mute from here if I need to. If you hear it again, let me know. Um, Hey, hello to everybody. We went from like two or three all of a sudden, bam, to 26, but we are recording this. So good evening. And I'll get back to your question in a minute, Brandy. I want to thank you all for giving me leeway on Monday. And I'm going to keep coughing tonight. So, you know, please excuse that. And uh, the good news is, since it's online, I can't pass to you whatever I've got. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so let's, let's kind of go back to Brandy's question about the groups and get that off our list. Mitchell and I are meeting tomorrow at 10. If you want a group or you want to work individually, that's your preference. Let us know by 10 tomorrow. Who's ever not on a group will assign groups and let you know. Okay, and that'll be your group. Okay, no more than four people. Uh, any comments on that? Any, anybody uh, professor, to chime professor? in? Yes. Yeah, this is Chipper. Uh, I'm just curious. I understand what you're saying by 10 in the morning. Um, do you need a topic or do you no. just need the groups? The people you want to work with. The people you want to okay. work with. Thank okay? you. Let's, let's do one thing at a time. So you'll have your groups. So that's by the end of the second week, you'll have your groups. Um, and, and like I said, Mitchell and I are going to meet tomorrow at 10. Sorry, if you see me do something, I'm cutting cheese and giving it to my dogs. Okay, so I don't want you to think I'm eating or anything while you're here. They're just annoying me. And they know I have cheese on the table. Um, so once we have the groups done, and the, the next thing is are the papers or presentations or projects. Now I taught a class this summer and uh, every, everybody was assigned to a group randomly and then you had to do a group project. And I got some feedback that some people work better alone or some people felt like they did more work or some people felt like they didn't get to contribute as much as they wanted because of group dynamics. So I made the option this semester that if you want to work alone, you can. <clears throat> so once you have the groups, this inter data, data anal uh, uh, enterprise risk and data analytics is a very interesting topic, but it's it's not like the class we had this summer and there's a lot of nuances and everything about this. So what, what Mitchell and I decided to do was to give you an option whether to come up with your own project because some of you know this more than others that have been in the program have want to know more about risk or to give you a case study that you could do. So you get an option for your paper and project. The project uh, you're to work on it as a group, but each paper is to be individual. And then also something this summer is we did our group presentations on Zoom, and I never felt like uh, that went well. Uh, we didn't get a lot of people sometimes and evaluations. I had groups evaluate other groups, and it would take a couple of days, sometimes longer than a couple of days to get evaluations back, and that held up my giving evaluations back. So I decided this time... The bet, and then some people, you know, would have connection problems or somebody in the group got caught in traffic or got caught in work, is that you make your group presentation and you video it. Um, 
and we'll post it and then people can look at it and review it from there. And we don't have to try to all be around our computers Wednesday at six o'clock. Uh, so I'd like some dialogue on that. Is that good for you all? Anybody got any input? I think that's a good idea. I do have a question though regarding the presentation part of it. I understand the paper and you know we all have to write our own papers and everything. Um, but my question is for the presentation part, are we just presenting basically what we've put in our paper, just like an outline of that? Or do we need to put together like a slideshow or you know anything like that? I think a slideshow is good. I think a presentation just summarizing how, let's say you pick a project and it's on a certain thing about enterprise risk, maybe, and I'm just pulling this out because obviously I love cybersecurity. How you find out that cybersecurity risk and reputational risk and these other things uh, contribute to that. Then your presentation would be explaining that so somebody that didn't do that work would learn from that. Okay. And, and maybe some of the things you found that were a little uh, surprising Presentations, we don't need to be that long. I'm guessing okay. max 10 minutes. We don't want, I can't remember what the rubric says, uh, but it's also a chance for each member, and we would like to see this, each member of your group have some kind of participation in the presentation. Okay. But, but yes, um, and I just think it would go better. So you can video it. So let's say you do the presentation and you kind of just don't like how it came out. Well, if you do it to the class, you kind of got a one, one shot. Right, right. Give you a chance to to make it kind of what you want. You don't have to go off the deep end and do all kinds of you know fancy schmancy stuff. But uh, but I think doing the video. So Mitchell's going to set that up in the next week or so. Okay, okay. Uh, so, but the papers to be your own. The papers to be like uh, again summarize what you did, but but talk about your contribution. Have some sources. So I get a good feeling that you contributed to the group. Hey, this is Andrea. I have a question about recording a presentation. I have never had to do that. Any software you would recommend to record a PowerPoint or a video <laughs> as we're presenting? One easy way to do it, but it's got its limitations, is voice over PowerPoint, which is in based in PowerPoint. The bad thing about voice over PowerPoint is if you go up the slide deck, it quits recording unless they've changed it. All right. Um, which is why when we couldn't get our Camtasia and Snagit to work right, and I did the voiceover PowerPoint for the very short introduction of class, you know, I almost sat on my hands like, just go down the slide deck because it doesn't warn you that it's shutting off the audio when you go up because it stores the audio with each slide. Uh, Mitchell, you got any input on this about other ways they could record it? I mean, most computers have a way to like record from your actual camera and you could use that if you uh, sort of split it up kind of presentations, but like she just said, the best way would probably be PowerPoint. And also, uh, uh, Professor Witt, yes. this is Joe, can't we also just, among our group, have a Zoom session and record that? Perfect, and yes. Good, PowerPoint? Excellent point. You can do a Zoom session among your group and you can record that. Okay, okay. great. I didn't well, even we'll know do, that was an option. Thank we you. Will, we'll get a little guide together on this. <coughs> Mitchell, put this on your to-do list. And then, um, what we'll do is create a channel on YouTube and everything and tell you how to post it. And then what I would like you to do is if, you know, if you can't go through everybody's presentations, because there's going to be a lot of them since the class is so big, uh, maybe we can organize them into some topics that would interest you. And then, but also I am going to ask you to review maybe two others and we, we're going to set that up on how we're going to get, get you to review others. I have one more question before we sure. move on. Um, I requested to work by myself on this. I haven't heard back, but I did send in a request for that just because my hours at work are very, um, can be very long <laughs> and change at the drop of a hat. Um, so I don't want to put anybody else out if I'm not available for something. Um, but I noticed in the Blackboard post that somebody had posted about doing a uh, cyber risk, which I was kind of leaning towards the same thing, but wanted to make it more generalized towards the legal field instead of just, um, cyber risk as a whole. And uh -huh. I wanted to make sure that that topic was okay. And it was okay that I did something kind of along the lines that somebody else had already. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, if, and if you say, Hey, I want to work with this person and we can work it out. Cause we're going to meet, you know, Saturday morning or Sunday morning at 2 AM or something. Bizarre. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you can change your idea from going to one, but yeah, you know, I love cyber. So um, just like last semester where there were a couple of people that had a project that had to do with financial, um, 
malfeasance and if the title company and some other cyber stuff, you know, feel free to reach out to me and ask them any questions or anything. And, and that's true for every group. I mean, I'm not just Great. saying for cyber, but for cyber, sometimes I can give you uh, some pointers just because I've spent, spent way too much of my life doing it. <laughs> so I right. continue to do it. Thanks. It just puts more gray hair on my head. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. <laughs> Other comments from the group? So the next topic I had on my list was, um, so I, I really want some input on this. This is a big group. So what I was thinking of doing is making Wednesday more structured if there was questions on the lectures or the postings or anything. But then Mondays, Wednesday, so that would be Wednesday Zoom and we would record it because I know everybody's schedule is different. <laughs> but on Monday, just make it more open office hours. So let's say your group wants to talk to me and, I, and I'm open during the day too. We can, if we can accommodate it around my schedule and your schedule, we can, we can talk at any time. I'm not restricting it from Monday and Wednesday. I, Unfortunately, I teach in College Station until seven o'clock Tuesday and Thursday, and then I get in my car and go back to Houston. So it's kind of hard to, to talk to people, unless you want to talk to me while I'm driving. Um, uh, so what I was considering doing is making Wednesday, six o'clock, more formal, we'll record it. Questions on, like I said, the lecture, the readings, input you have that you think's interesting, uh, Anything like that. And then Monday will be office hours for more individual or groups. What do you think? Would you, would you prefer that? Here's why, I'm, here's why I'm coming from. I don't want to say something on Wednesday that I wish I had said on Monday. Or say something on Monday and forget to say it on Wednesday. I'd like to have Wednesday say, okay, everybody heard me say the same thing on the papers, on the presentations. Oh, on this interesting article, on this topic, where the class is going. And then Monday, it's just more, we don't have to worry if I say something to one person and not the other. I'm so, totally fine with that. How's everybody else feel? I think that makes sense. And then that's also like trying to divide you all into Monday and Wednesday. And, it, you know, if they will be recorded, we, we, figured, we figured that out. Last Wednesday's has been posted and we now have our own way to do this. Uh, any other discussion on it from anybody? Nope. Just, you know, I was told uh, there, there were going to be 15 people in this class, and there's 54. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of more than 15 <laughs> by a factor of almost four, right? Um, so what have you thought so far of the class, the lecture, the videos, uh, the reading I put on the, on the market watch about taking the data from Glassdoor? Did everybody get a chance to read that one? It was an interesting, if not, I'll just summarize it. Um, I'm looking to see if I had it open someplace. Um, a, a man who uh, manages something like $400 million to invest in companies. So how do you get data? You know, how do you try to figure out whether that company is going to have problems? And it's a very short article. If you haven't read it, it's, it was Market Watch, which is a very strange thing for me to find something about data analytics. But he took employee reported data from Glassdoor. And he began to make, now he's using other data too, but he's um, makes better predictions because who knows best when a company is going to get in trouble? The people working there, right? Employees. So he, he made a point in the article, he doesn't go for social media data, it costs too much, it's unreliable, but he found that when people reported on their experiences of working in the company, he could actually predict management problems sometimes before management did. So that's a powerful data analytics. And, he, and he's very successful at what he's doing, so it must work. So any input on that? Would anybody have thought of that? Because I'll tell you right now, I would have never thought of it. Um, hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hi. This is Stephanie Newell. Um, yeah, I have actually thought of it. That's, <laughs> it kind of gives you an idea of the health of the company um, just using, using um, Glassdoor. Like, I used it, I kind of used something similar when I was looking for jobs. Like, the more, you know, like, you can tell which ones are written by, um, 
the PR firm and which ones are more honest. And so you can kind of get an idea of whether, and it's not necessarily companies, some of them are nonprofits, like whether that nonprofit can actually afford to hire you or if this is just, you know, they put up a posting for a job that may not be actually funded. That's interesting. Um, that's so, so that's great because one of the one of the problems we have in data analytics, first of all, is getting data, but second of all, and in, in, in validating the data. So you're saying from Glassdoor, you, you have a high uh, trust factor in it. At kinda like you look at some of the um, the the reviews are not written by actual employees. They're written by written by employees talking about their actual job. They're written by people who are um, paying. The recruiters, right. kind of like the recruiters, the headhunters for that company. Yeah, and you're yeah. saying those, those kind of stick out, or could you they do, do it? They do, they because do. Because they'll, they'll say things like, because um, they ask about you know your feelings about the CEO and if that person is doing a good job. And if they say the CEO is great, and you know he's been doing nothing but a good job at, at this company and all you know just it's too glowing and then the person is like saying that they had a job in the mail room you know that's maybe not real yeah <laughs> that's good that's good that's good um i met nick duffield who heads the institute at a m and college station on data science and i explained to him what we were doing in this class this week i, I haven't been able to in the last two weeks because he was sick for two weeks <laughs> and he told me he didn't know anything about risk or how to tie the data to risk but if we could pose a problem he'd get a graduate student to do the data analytics and i said well i'm not sure if we posed a problem, you could find the data. And I was quite surprised when he said, oh, we can always get the data. Getting the data is no problem. I, and I was like, really? Because I would be sitting there thinking, you know, if this is the problem, where would I get the data? So if anyone would have an interesting case study they would like or analysis they would like to do, I'll go back to him and propose it. Um, because I, what, I, what I wanted from him was to say, how does data science how does this work? Well, one of the things that I work in political campaigns right now, and, um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I, I know <laughs> I'm a campaign manager, and um, I have managed campaigns in Georgia and in Alaska, and um, one of my former clients is now the uh, House Minority Speaker for the state of Georgia. Wow! So I mean, it has been successful, but. Um, I wanted to frame my uh, my project around uh, political campaigns. That's yeah, I like that. Yeah, well, and the thing is, I, I'm not sure how to hone in on that because there are a lot of ways to tell the health of a campaign. And you know, a lot of people say, "Well, you look at the money. Like, what is their cash on hand? What is their fundraising?" Right, but just from working in campaigns, I think a lot, I think that one of the things that I would like to look at is actually staff turnover. Oh, because, see, that would be great. That would be great. That's an excellent yeah. insight. Yeah, staff turnover tells you a lot about what's actually going on in the campaign and if the internal workings of the campaign are effective. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> I just want to chime in on that. Um, I do a lot of work um, with contractors. We have a lot of contractors that we hire to do um, the non-hydrocarbon pieces and staff turnover on um, janitorial is huge. And it makes you look at what is going on in the rest of the companies. I, I just had to chime in on that because I was thinking um, whenever you said employee turnover that, that that was something that was pertinent as well. So that's something huh. that, that impacts other industries as well. That's something you can get through your HR. You know what, janitorial turnover might also say something about the way that, about the um, facility, like the actual facility and the, um, the architecture. Like if there's a problem with the architecture of the building. Cause I read a, I read a thing about, um, 
how they look at architecture to determine if um, if uh, why people were getting sick in hospitals, and it was behind dry air, and it was because of the way the buildings had been built, the way they had been structured. So maybe it has maybe the janitorial turnover has something to do with the actual structures of the building. That was random. I'm sorry. It's not a good idea. No, that's that's interesting. You know, we live in a sea of data, and I just always think how much we can pick up if we can just look at the data around us and filter it. You know, and something like that. Um, one of the things that always, and this kind of, you were talking about architecture now, but one of the things that always stood out to me on 9-11 is how could they have built the Twin Towers with the staircases too small to evacuate the amount of people in the towers? You know, why didn't someone say, hmm, bad idea, right? Bad idea. You know what? Um, I actually do have some insight after working for Gerald Hines, um, and I managed Williams Tower in the Galleria, Houston Galleria area. Uh -huh. it, it, the stairwells are, whenever Williams Tower was first built, offices were huge. Uh, I mean, back in the 80s, they, they were just, you know, big corner offices. It was just a, a, a lower number of head count of occupants per floor. So if you have a 25,000 square foot floor plate, you're not talking about as many people as we have today. The demographics of the buildings change over years, whereby they don't get small tenants or lower number of tenants. Uh, the tenants are, are in the businesses that have those offices are looking, how can we fit more people in without paying more rent? Oh, well, we knock out all these walls and we have open workspace. I mean, there's just all kinds of, uh, I had to remodel the, uh, the mail room at Williams Tower because Williams Company sold out. They had 700,000 square feet. They gave back to Heinz. And as a direct result, Heinz couldn't sublease or lease out that 700,000 square feet to one tenant. Instead, it went to 22 tenants. So uh, just the basic demographics of a commercial high-rise building changes so much from when it was initially built and what it was orig originally built for. Well, whoever posted, whoever said it, I sorry, I didn't write down the name on the political campaigns <coughs> or on the uh, on the glass door. I've got a, a question for you too. I was at this conference today in Port Arthur, and it's Coast Guard, cybersecurity, FBI was there, uh, Department of Justice talking about data breaches. And what surprised me is even uh, they ask about a case where two people were paid to hack and got arrested, <laughs> and. I was quite surprised when the government guy said, you know, the media doesn't get the story right. And I, I, and I thought, how much of this data that we, that we think we see, how do we validate it, in other words? Like, I was quite surprised he would say that. Well, you know, the media didn't get the facts right on that case. He didn't actually know the case, but he was guessing. Do you, do you get my point? Like, we talk about the data. We're going to get data. We're going to get public accessible data. But we do have this question if it's valid or not. He may be right or wrong. I don't know. I don't know the particular of that case. Data well, can be manipulated. What's that? I was saying data can be manipulated. Yes. Like in the glass door, if you have HR or someone inside public um, posting those comments, then you're manipulating the data in your favor. Right. Well, yeah, that's that's what I was saying before about you can tell which ones are fake. So, like, even if you're not actually crunching the numbers, you just kind of eliminate certain data points simply because you know they're fake. You know, like, you do it unconsciously. But um, as far as getting data, that was one of the things I was concerned about in doing political campaigns. And so I emailed um, emailed the, the campaign manager for Cory Booker to see if I could use their data. And I promised that I would give them my risk management plan once it was over. I haven't heard back from him yet, but I know him, so hopefully he will allow me to do so. Because, I mean, like, if you get the data directly from the source, you're not getting it filtered through the media. Right. Yeah. Because right. most, most, <laughs> most people in the media, like, I often forget this, but when I started working in campaigns, um, 
I quickly learned that they don't have degrees in the things that they're talking about. And, and it, you know, that kind of, it, it's problematic in that they're reporting to America on something that they don't really have enough of a basis to really talk about it clearly on. So, um, I mean, like a lot of times, like I have a lot of friends that are reporters because I work in politics, and sometimes I feel like, ooh, that's not what that law says, like at all. <laughs> you know, they don't they don't pick up on the subtle nuances of things like and and or. Like, <laughs> there's a difference between them, right? And uh, so that you know, when you're when you're talking about the media, you have to remember that the person writing the story maybe doesn't have a degree in whatever marine science or, or um, yes or law or you know what the what the important facts were and that's what i also thought about well we are being told about this case our only source is the data unless we i mean the media unless we want to go look at the public records which most people won't do they're not going to go look at the legal documents because they're hard to find they're actually all publicly available um, right, and then they're hard to decipher because you have a bunch of stuff in there that's, that's noise. Uh, bringing right. it back to, to enterprise risk and data analytics, my point is that to really do risk well, you got to have good data. And in computer science, where I am right now, we're in the middle of a controversy because AI, artificial intelligence, uh, or machine learning, is based on training on data sets. So it trains for making predictions on existing data. And we have now in a controversy because we have found that a lot of the algorithms being used are biased, which, which on a simple level makes sense. If you put bad data in or, or limited data in, but at the same time, the problem has gotten so complex that Amazon had a multi-million dollar, 10 or $20 million uh, research into how to basically poach employees from other companies. And they had to shut it down because the algorithms were biased and they couldn't figure out why. They, they felt that the data wasn't biased and they couldn't figure out why the algorithms that were telling them who to go after were biased. And rather than take a PR hit and do something that you know, wasn't ethical, they just shut the project down. Um, and, it, and it all has to do with when we talk about risk, when we talk about anything, data analytics, all based on the data, where that data is and how valid it is. Now, Nick Duffield said he can find the data. So if any of you have a project in mind and you would like to see if I can get him to find the data, uh, send me an email and in the email header put find data and then describe what you want and I'll send it to him because he did offer a graduate student, you know, and said, hey, help. this is a guy who's a number cruncher. He's a bachelor's in math and statistics. He's heavy duty into actually manipulating the data, which is not what this course is about. But again, when I said something about the data, he goes, oh, we can find the data, uh, which I'm going to follow up with him on that because... That's what I would think would have been the limitation. So, other comments? Are there people, anybody want to talk about their topic they're thinking of pursuing and get some feedback? Uh, Professor, this is Joe. I had a quick question. Sure. Um, on the attachment that you put on the prompt for the discussion groups, there was a listing of about, I guess, six or seven different methods, maybe, of, uh, that we should ex use to create the, uh, right. the project. I don't have it right in front of me, but are those methods that we'll be talking about, or we need to independently explore those? No, we will be talking about them, and my goal is very quickly, with them, so we don't do it until the eighth week, and you're doing the paper the last, uh, is to get sources out there. So. Uh, to discuss each of those methods. Now keep in mind, here's what I want you to know about each method. How does it work? What does it take as input? What's its limitations, right? Um, 
Some methods are very data intensive. They give really good answers, but it takes you so long to get the data and build the model that uh, others are, are more uh, uh, qualitative than quantitative. Some are very quantitative. Bayesian beliefs networks, BBNs are very quantitative. So what, we're, what Mitch and I, our next project will be is to say, here's what you need to know about this in, in a kind of a cookbook format, okay? Um, we're not gonna ask you to, you know, to actually perform the analysis, but more like how the analysis would be performed. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So tacking on to that, I was looking at the list and, and it has bow tie analysis on there. Uh -huh. um, and I just wanna ask, is this the same bow tie analysis that I've done this a bow tie analysis for um, our HSSE group and yeah. it was for a project is you is that the same kind of yes okay I see you nodding your head okay okay yeah. okay yeah so yeah. safety and say yeah. those safety data numbers and putting them I into think the that's ties. basically where it came from I want to say that's where I first ah, okay. okay. oil and gas on the risk. Okay. Of yeah, they, we love bow tone analysis. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Other questions, comments, concerns? Am I giving you guys enough reading? Yes. No, I, don't, I don't want anybody to complain at the end of the semester they didn't get their money's worth. So, you know, but if you want me to go on and add a good term or fine. I'll just let me know. Mitch will be happy to grade it. <laughs> okay, what can I do for you? I've got some, I got some ideas from this that I want to follow up on. Uh, but what can I do for you? Can I get your, my goal is to do the recordings on Sunday. And the reason I do that, <coughs> we've got the slides prepared for several weeks ahead. But I read a lot, so when I do something, I want to know that, that up to the minute, if there's something like that market watch, article i can do that um so I, my goal is my schedule is to record on sundays and post them for the week um i might get ahead a week or two but i don't know we'll see um but what can i do for you uh, otherwise what else do you want to know about this topic any suggestions Hey, Paula, this is Andrea again. I don't have any suggestions per se, but I did want to take an opportunity to throw out an idea that Chipper and I are bouncing back and forth for the paper. Uh -huh. So this is very rough. I apologize ahead of time. Uh, biometrics and yes. why it's a great alternative and how it can be measured. Okay. Is there a paper in there? What do you oh, think? Yeah, yeah. So any particular aspect of biometrics, how you're going to use them? So, yeah, uh, at first glance, access, uh, building access, uh, security access to the basics. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe how they're being used today and, and throw in a portion of how the future might look. I don't okay. know. The, ne the negative, the negative yeah. to that would also be um, the as a whole the identity being stolen in terms right. of fingerprints or eye biometrics. Um, there's also something called ear biometrics, um, that type of thing. So uh, ear prints, lip prints, palm prints, all of that could be. It, right now is digitally formatted and basically turns into a mathematical algorithm it's a hash so uh, technically although i haven't read any information about it that hash itself could be stolen so technically it's not your fingerprint that's stolen it's the hash that's stolen so that might be something that's down the road that uh, could be a criminal criminal use or possibly, um, and I don't know if you'd consider this in biometrics, but cases where conclusions are made that are logical and rational and wrong. <coughs> Let me give you an example and tell me if this fits into that. The Madrid subway bombing, which I think happened in 2005, there was an American from uh, Portland, Oregon, who was a lawyer who had converted to being a Muslim. 
and he was arrested. When you become a lawyer, you get fingerprinted. Actually, when you're a law student. So his fingerprints matched. And he claimed he had never been to Spain, okay? But he's a lawyer, he converted, you know, he's from Portland, Oregon, whatever. And it took the US federal government two years and this guy suffered a lot of abuse because he was labeled as a terrorist and arrested. <clears throat> and then they said, you know what? You're right. It wasn't. Yes, ma'am. That I, I'll give you a little bit more information there. Uh, I actually was working with the agency that worked with that. Uh -huh. And uh, there's a little bit more to the story that I can't t discuss, but um, all of that type of stuff comes down to human error. Yes, that's all I'll say. I just I could keep it at that. <laughs> no, that's good. That's no. And that and that's and but but you agree that you could still have logical, rational conclusions that are wrong. Because yes, correct. Correct. <clears throat> and that's the only case I know like that. I, I just know that because I actually teach it in law for my engineers. I don't teach law to law students because of the issue of standing when he no longer was indicted. His court case was heard before the Supreme Court as uh, part of the Patriot Act that he was arrested under being unconstitutional, but he lacked standing because he was not found guilty under indictment. The Supreme Court basically said, we can't, you know, you may have a constitutional case there, buddy, but guess right, what? Right, right, yeah. So I actually teach that case as standing and not really that, but that is one I know. Um, no, I think that's a fascinating topic because of how we're going to facial recognition. I recently went to Europe for a week, at the end of September. Now I had been out of the country, when was the last time I was out of the country, but whatever. Uh, last April or May in Houston, uh, the federal government put in their global entry. And before you put in your fingerprints and it took a picture and you slid in your passport. Well, now it reads your face. Now, my, my passport picture is pretty good, but my face coming off after an 11 hour flight, you know, with my hair pulled up and I'm tired. Doesn't match your picture. <laughs> no, it did. I mean, it didn't match the picture, but I mean, and I'm looking down at the camera cause I don't realize this. I'm getting ready to do the fingerprints and the other stuff. And I'm looking down and it took this picture and bam, all my information, bam, came up, name, birth date. <clears throat> and I'm like, Whoa. And so I looked into it and, and that's global entry is now using facial recognition in Houston and some, and some cities, but I was amazed that it, yeah. it was almost hurt that it recognized me. I'm looking at my past. <laughs> that looks pretty good. That looks like the after picture. This one looked like the before picture, right? <coughs> um, I'd love to know what their error rate is or how many, or who they can identify. Um, but I think that's a fascinating topic. Uh, you said this was uh, uh, Chipper and Andrea, right? I think that's a fascinating topic. It's great. I'm for it. I can't wait to read it. No pressure, Chipper. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> no pressure. Expectations just shot. <laughs> I'm glad you're on board, but I didn't expect you to be that excited. So, <laughs> well, you know, um, I love the I love anything with technology because just like I said in one of my earlier lectures, how you have a, a certain terminology we use old time risk, but we, we're changing it because nothing's stable. Well, biometrics, uh, informatics, all this kind of stuff that's coming out now. It's almost like the technology developed so fast, it shot out ahead of where we thought we would be. You know, we, uh, I don't think 10 years ago, we knew what we would be capable of doing now with this. And, it's, and so what I think is, oh my gosh, what are we gonna have in another five or 10 years, right? It's, it's amazing what can be done with that. Um, and, and I'm all for it. If, if technology can uh, be perfected to the point that it makes us more secure, that it does eliminate some of the human error, uh, that it helps find missing people. You know, the, uh, the case where the guy is on Google Maps, and uh, do you know this case? And they're looking over, he's actually looking on Google Maps in the neighborhood where he grew up and there was a pond and he sees a car. Have you read this case? And it turned out someone like 20 years ago disappeared, which I would think someone would say, you know, he was driving home, maybe we should dredge that pond. And he sees a car in the pond from the technology available on his computer. 
you know, just like, I'm just like, this is, this is amazing use of technology. Um, totally happenstance. So anybody else want to talk about their topic and I'll get all excited about it. <laughs> hey, I tell you what, I'll, I'll jump in and just uh, sure. put it out there. I, I don't have a group and I don't have a topic, but if anybody's looking to pick someone up, uh, let me know. You want to shoot me an email or just, uh, yeah, let me know what I need to do and we'll get on it. But I, I don't have anybody right now and I'd like to be in a group if that makes sense. Sure. What's your background and what kind of, what, what would be of interest to you? Uh, you know, anything really, operations. Uh, again, you know, I've done audit, compliance, investigations, uh, computer forensics, uh, a little bit of everything. You know, I've come from a law enforcement background as well. So uh, I'm really open to anything and uh, always looking to learn about something new. So if somebody has room, let me know. Okay. And I'm going to think about topics tonight. Because, like I said, <laughs> a big part of my day today, hearing about maritime cybersecurity and uh, with the Coast Guard and uh, FBI and some uh, attorneys assigned to uh, East Texas for the Justice Department. So if anybody's got an idea, let him know and I'll think of some as well. Anybody else wanna put their name out there for something? I have a background in audit as well. And so we can, uh, brainstorm and see if we can come up with a topic okay compliance forensics and that sort of thing okay all right who's that leslie yes okay leslie i'll reach out to you through email and then we can see if we can uh maybe get a topic and, and get started on something does that sound good yeah that sounds great thanks okay can you class can you include me <laughs> yeah who's that is that annie, annie Taylor. <laughs> okay yeah you bet annie no, can I throw my name in that as well, Elizabeth Stallcup? <laughs> okay. Write these down. Well, there you go, Laura. <laughs> yeah. All in one night, right? <laughs> yeah, that easy. Yeah. There you, go. <laughs> you know what I'd like you to do too is when you get your topic, send me an email and copy everybody in your group and, and do me a favor, put on the header something like you know, topic or something that caps to my eye. And just give me a little a description of what your topic is. Okay. Yeah. Just for everybody, so I can, uh, I'll tell you, we've got two people in this that can't be in the Zoom meetings. Um, long story, they're not in the Masters of Jurisprudence, they're in a master's degree in cybersecurity that doesn't have enough courses for them. So they signed up for this, and but I made them because of the computer science background. They're going to help me develop the ontology of how different factors feed into enterprise risk to share with the class. They have a conflict from 5.45 to 7, Monday and Wednesday. So I said, okay, you have to listen to the recordings. Um, anybody that's got any ideas on that too? Um, because when, I, when you leave here, what I want you to leave with at the end of the semester is kind of a toolkit and analysis and understanding of how this all works. And I think just having a framework of what risk factors will be that leads to enterprise risk would be useful. And I haven't found one. Anybody's got one that wants to show me. I haven't found, I hear, you know, well, it's this and this, got in it, and there's, you know, got to think about this and this, but I haven't found those 25 or 30 factors that you need to consider. Um, and we start linking them together. Uh, so that's what they're going to be doing. They have a group of two. If anybody wants to join them, you can join them. I was just going to say, um, Carmen and I are, we're, we're going to get together and we're going to post what our topic is. And if anyone wants to join, you know, hop on. Perfect. 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 Anybody totally lost on a topic? Okay. Um, what else do we need to discuss tonight? If you didn't get a chance to read the market watch that we talked a little bit about, uh, it's, it's a quick article, it's a two minute read. <clears throat> Here's what I think is fascinating. So let me tell you another case study. <clears throat> OPM was breached, oh, I don't know, four or five years ago, Office of Personnel Management. And quite frankly, I think, you know how they say, lock them up, put them in prison. Well, I do think that director of OPM should have faced the consequences because 
data that is indicative that something bad was happened was ignored. So it is the largest intelligence breach in the United States in my lifetime, and I grew up during the Cold War. But what is interesting is, and if anyone's interested in this paper, I won't put it out for the whole class just because I don't want you to read it and say, why, are you read, why, do, why do we have to read this? But someone, uh, a, a good analysis of what this breach did, so it took basically everything buddy that had a security clearance, <clears throat> all their paperwork for that clearance was in the hands of the Chinese. So you fill out, I think, a seven-page paper. If you've got a gambling problem, if you've got an addiction problem, you put, you put your whole life there. But what was interesting is someone went back and did the data and analytics and discovered on the, on the brief, the same group in China that had gotten this data was behind the Ashley Madison. Remember Ashley Madison where you wanted to cheat on your spouse, right? And the same group was behind the breach on Anthem, which was a large government health service provider. So to me, that's fascinating that they found from the signature of how the attacks went down that it was the same group. So someone got all that data, plus why on your 127 pages? Because now we got your Ashley Madison and we got your health records. Uh, that's the power of data analytics. You can look at the actual signature of how the data breach happened. Was Ashley Madison that website that was for married people who wanted to have a side fling? Right. Oh, I remember that. Okay. Yes. It, it's a paper by the Sands Institute and it goes through on why it's a punch, but also that it's the same signature. And that's what data analytics can be like in investigation. Wait a minute. Here are some seemingly desperate, uh, dis, you know, different uh, attacks or events or crimes that are going on, but it turns out they're all linked, you know? And now I don't know what the government's going to do with that information since pretty much everything is in Chinese hands anyway. And it was a Chinese attack. That's, that's proven. So well, that's you know, how analytics is used. Yes. Well, you know, Professor Brill worked on the um, 2008 uh, Chinese hackers with the Obama campaign. I didn't like, know that. Yeah, the, uh, I guess he did it. He offered it to both. Uh, candidate, so he offered it to McCain and Obama, and the McCain campaign said they didn't need computers anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, they they found that hackers attacked the 2008 Obama campaign, and Professor Brill was on the security group that looked into that. And I, I wonder if it's him. the same group. Could be, and you know what's <clears throat> what's interesting about that is. What also gives us value in data and data analytics is looking at it over time. So were, you, were we surprised if this happened in 2008 and what happened in 2016? You know, right, right. You know, this, this, these guys just don't start overnight and say we're going to do this. These are law, they're called advanced persistent threats. Um, they are persistent, meaning they take time. It takes, you know, if it takes a hacker five years, but he walks away with $15 million, well, you know, that's not a bad investment for five years, right? Right. The, the, the other question is, if they knew it happened in 2008, and I mean, he did television interviews about this after it was declassified, if they knew it happened in 2008, then why was there not, you know, protections in place? Uh, I don't want to bore you with the details, but I do have a timeline of when the Democratic National Committee was hacked, and it was in uh, August and September, and yet they were ha they they didn't they didn't come out with it. They didn't hack until April. <laughs> they literally didn't leave the FBI. The FBI called and left message. Like, Seriously, you couldn't put an agent at the door. <clears throat> but by the time August and September to April. Everything they did was, was, you know, there was no getting it back. Um, huh. It's, it's, uh, well, I worked, to see if I, worked on a, I worked on a group called Tech for Obama, and it was all these tech workers out of Silicon Valley and um, actually all over the country. 
there are like social media people and then there were tech people and they all kind of, you know, got together to, you know, provide tech support, background tech information to the campaign. And um, that was in 2012. And then in 2016, the same group of people came together and they were like, okay, Stephanie, you reach out to the campaign, to Hillary's campaign after, you know, we had a, a nominee and offer the same stuff. And the Hillary campaign was not interested. Yeah. And they got hit. A bad. When you, yeah. when you read these, uh, and, and I got this from, uh, I had to make a talk at a group at AM. I verified this with someone who's in the Convention Institute and then at the Hobby School of Public Policy at, at U of H. I mean, I went through all the data and he, and he said, this is right, this is what happened. And I'm like, are you serious? How could somebody know this was going on? I mean, the, uh, uh, John Podesta <laughs> got spearfished, you know, got, this is your Google account needs to be uh, your password changed. So he enters his password. Calls an IT person, doesn't have the IT person come to his office, calls the IT person, and the IT person sends him an email that says this appears to be valid. And then later on, the IT person said, oh, I meant to say this appears to be invalid. Okay, what do you go to his office and said, don't click on this? So basically, he gave his credentials and everything that was going on in his email was in the Russian hands, and that was August or September. I mean, when you read it, it's like a comedy of errors, except it's not funny. Well, I can tell you why it happened. Um, well, not why it happened, but one of the factors that led to it happening um, a lot of the people who worked on Hillary's 2016 campaign came from her 2008 campaign. And so they did not, they were leery of Obama people. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, Obama had cornered the market on, for lack of a better term, the nerds, right? So... Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was a Wall Street they, Journal article after he was elected, after the Mitt Romney campaign in 2012. It talked about how good his data analytics was, that if you hadn't voted by 1 o'clock on election day, you got a call. And oh, yeah. People, the, help set, the, the help desk, the guy that was supposed to be running the system, couldn't get anybody to answer the phone to the help desk to the point that he's running around with his hair on fire and he doesn't even get to vote. I mean, well, Wall Street, in the Wall Street Journal, you know, is very politically conservative. So they were even like, how could, how can you have one group that gets this? This is the way to run a campaign in 20, whatever that was, 12, and another group that can't even get out of the starting blocks. And that should have been a lesson for all future campaigns. Um, but they didn't, they were not interested in Obama people at all. No. I mean, they were very suspicious. Like, they never, According to my sources, they never, and I know we're kind of off track a little bit here, but they're, they never turn their servers over to the FBI. The servers, with, um, the allegation that it was the Russians came from a company called CrowdStrike. And later on, CrowdStrike said we gave, we imaged hard drives and gave copies of them to the FBI. But they sh in my book, they should have turned it over to an investigative agency first and the company second. And that, that's not me being political. I don't care. I don't care. It's, it's no, no, no. You're, you're right. Um, but, I mean, I, I witnessed it. So, you know, why <laughs> you turn it over to a company? Well, anyone, anybody else? We've got, we've got some great topics swimming around here. Anybody else needs to help with the topic? Hey, this is JD. Yes. So for our project, we don't have to make sure that we have all the data available, right? No. We're, just, we're looking at and addressing the topic because we're not running the actual statistics and all the other it. things yeah. that you are, uh, those different models, you don't have the software. The yeah. No. So we're kind of describing. That's beyond, that's beyond the scope of this class unless you're all sitting there having bachelor's and master's in mathematics and statistics that I didn't know about. Yeah. This is just more way. You're going to be a manager. Somebody's going to come to you and say, oh, you have this problem, so here's how I think you should solve it. And you need to have a toolkit to say, wait a minute, I don't think that's going to work, or hey, that only works in these cases. 
is for, but that's going to take a lot of data. How are you going to get the data? How are you going to validate the data? You know, in other words, so you can make not actually do it. When, when we talk about data science, it's not like you'd hire me to be your data scientist. You'd hire me and 20 or 30 other people and we'd be sitting here cranking, um, doing our stuff. So, so exactly right what you said. Okay, anybody else got anything? Anybody gonna watch the game? I just don't know if I can watch the game tonight. I'm afraid I'll, it'll, it'll just do me in. <laughs> After last night's game, I was driving to Port Arthur in the dark, in the rain, after being, and it's and I'm listening to the game on satellite radio, ESPN radio, and I'm like, oh my God, can this get any worse? And it started raining harder, and I said, okay, I should never ask the question, can it get any worse? So. Yes, it can get worse if Joe Buck continues to be commenting. <laughs> I I mean, it's a drinking game by now. Every time you hear someone who doesn't like Joe Buck, you just... Yeah. <laughs> just drink. I mean, that guy cannot Facebook's say anything possible Halloween about the Astros to save his life. Uh, Facebook's got Halloween. Some, somebody put something in Halloween about it, Joe Buck. On, I mean, Halloween decorations in their front yard. I'm like, hey. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, that guy. So, so let me tell you another aspect of data. So I drive a Toyota Highlander. I bought it after I lost my car in Harvey. Um, this is also a Toyota Highlander. This one being newer has a lot more technology. And there's a certain point, a coffee cup appears, like a coffee cup that says, is it time to take a break? Or is it time for a rest? And I can't figure out what triggers it. <laughs> At first I thought it was me changing lanes without properly making a turn signal when I was going through 290 construction. The last night I was on the road and I was driving straight and every so often it comes out brighter. And I'm like, I am on whatever road it is from 10 to Port Arthur. It's, there's no place there to stop, okay? If there was some place to stop, it would be like a place where they're gonna, you know, be the chainsaw massacre or something. I mean, like, I, please stop pressing this icon and telling me I need a rest, right? It's only 1030, I'm not falling asleep. But it brings up a privacy question, uh, who gets that data? You know, Toyota actually owns the data. So I'm like, is, am I driving away? I don't think so. Is it saying I've been driving for too long and I haven't stopped? You know, I don't know. But anyway, it was just kind of funny because I'm like on a dark road in the rain with this thing flashing. Is it time for a rest? And it's like, seriously, I've gone 30 miles. I haven't seen a gas station. I haven't seen a, you know, I haven't seen a Bucky's. I haven't seen any place. My car does the same thing. Same here. Mine does too. I turned it off in my setting somewhere. I can't remember where, but um, my, mine was doing the exact same thing. Mine, this is only the second time it's done it. And the first time I thought it was really because I was going through a lot of construction and changing lanes and it was, it was counting the times I changed lanes without properly signaling. Last night I was driving well. <laughs> So anything else? Anybody else got any input? Otherwise, uh, well, Monday night will be office hours. You'll have your groups tomorrow. We've talked about the uh, paper and presentation. Um, any other issues, questions, concerns, anything you need from me? Is that a, is that a big no with all the crickets? <laughs> All right, then I'm going to uh, end this meeting and publish this to the cloud and it's supposed to work automatically. If it doesn't, we'll figure it out tomorrow when I meet with Mitch. All right? Okay, have a great okay, evening. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.